leading us in worship today. If you thought that stuff was good, wait till the end. It's going to get even better. Um, we started this series last week, if you are new or if you were out of town uh, last week, called I Lived. And uh, we wanted to use that song as an embrace of one of the greatest disciples to ever walk the earth. If you read the Apostle Peter's story, you can truly say that he lived, man. He wanted it all. And today's story is going to exemplify that. Um, if you're catching up from last week, uh, we were talking about Peter's calling and how God provided this great catch. And today we're going to be talking about getting out of the boat. And, and uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Last week uh, when the story starts, right, Jesus is asking to get in the boat. And uh, this week we're going to see that Peter's going to be asking to get out of the boat. And I think that you've got to get Jesus in your boat uh, in order to receive that calling, that, that purpose that God has. And then that prepares you for the moment when the boat is no longer what you need to be in, right? You want to be after chasing Jesus for the rest of your life. And so I hope today that you are chasing after Jesus. And we all have a boat. It's metaphorical. Um, I know that one child um, asked their parents uh, last week, like, well, we got to buy a boat because... <laughs> How can Jesus get in our boat if there's not a boat? And I thought that was clever and cute. Um, so uh, today we're going to be picking up in just a moment. Um, but I want to do one little uh, announcement before we get started. And that is that Easter is upon us, folks. Easter, the first Easter in the building is upon us. We're going to be doing five services, okay? Five services. Um, it will be a record-breaking Easter. And why am I telling you this now? Because this is what we call the Super Bowl at Genesis Metro. We give free tickets out. You don't even have to pay to go to church to hear the greatest story that has ever been written, the greatest life that has ever been lived, and they died and he rose again, and you are the only thing standing between someone and them being here and experiencing that message. And don't, don't even bring that weak stuff in here. Like, I don't know if they'll say yes. We, every year, have Hindus, Muslims, atheists that come to Easter services. This is Texas, y'all. We go to church. It doesn't matter what we are. We go to church. And so, Imagine, like, if you can't even get someone to come on Easter, right? Now, that's, that's bad, okay? That's bad, all right? You can do it. I promise you, if you invite five people to Easter, at least three of them will come. And so we would love for you to invite someone and then to know that you assisted God in having an eternal impact on someone's soul, the trajectory of their family, that's what makes it all worth it. So today, I hope that you'll start considering, and we're going to ask you to RSVP, because when you have five services, you don't want like a 1,000 at one and 30 at another, so that's the way we crowd control, okay? And so you need to help us, okay? Help us, RSVP. All right, now we'll get into today's message. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, I've been telling y'all, the first service, their energy is just like, it's like, go to the first service, you'll see, like it's different, like, all right? So we gotta, we gotta bring the energy in the second service, okay? Is everybody ready? Is everybody ready? I know, I know the guests come to the second service and you're like, I'm not really sure about these people yet, okay? You're gonna find that we're gonna preach the Bible, but we're gonna have a good time while we do it. And he's like, is this guy trying to be funny? Is he trying to be a comedian? I am funny, I just want you to know that. <laughs> I am funny. And it doesn't matter if you laugh or not. I know I'm funny. Okay. So um, I try to bring some levity um, to the moments uh, because they're so serious. Um, they're so serious whenever we're talking about God's word and, and where you're at on your journey. And I hope today that you'll be considering, you know, what is my story? What is it that I need to leave in order to follow after God? Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's jobs, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that we might have to disconnect from in order to follow after Jesus. And so I hope that we'll inspire you today. So it says in Matthew chapter 14, immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead to, of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After dismissing the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. 
But the boat was already over a mile from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against it. Number one, points, every great story has a great storm, all right? Every great story has a great storm. And we have to pick up our context in order to get the profundity of this point. Um, and and the, whenever you see that word immediately, I encourage you when you're studying your Bible, I would read at least a chapter at a time, but you'd even be even better off reading a book at a time. So start chapter one and roll through it. So uh, we learned last week that the calling began on the shores of Galilee. And then this story picks up right after Jesus has fed the 5,000, all right? So the context is Jesus has proven he's the God of the impossible. He's the God of the amazing. He's the God that if you bring him your little and you bring him your broken and allow him to bless it, that he can expand it, he can multiply it. And then they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers after it was all said and done. And then it says immediately, after that, he said, now y'all go get in that ship. Y'all go get in that boat. Y'all go get in that, y'all just go on over there. So like they're walking to this boat after having picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. So the context of today is that he is the God of the amazing. He is the God of the impossible. And he's sending them out now in the ship into the middle of of a storm. Man, every great story has a great storm. When you think about it in your life, when you think about the stories you tell, if you didn't have adversity, how could you ever get to amazing? right? Would you guys agree that when you tell your story, it's like, here is what was happening, and then this happened, and that's how we were able to overcome? Right? If you went through COVID as a small business owner, you have, if you made it, then you have reason to worship in here today. And the church said, Amen. I mean, that was the test of all tests catastrophic supply chain issues. You remember trying to go, if you were trying to buy a car and they did, like, do you remember empty lots? Does anybody remember that? Remember there, like, there was something about microchips? Like we ran out of microchips in the world. Does anybody, does anybody remember that? That was just a few short years ago. Like, and, and when you tell that story, right? You tell about this struggle. You tell about this storm. And what did you have to do? How did you have to ration? How did you have to figure out how to operate, to move during all of that? And it's the same thing on a marital level. I guarantee you. Every great story has a great storm. God never promised that it would be easy. You remember when you got married? Does anybody remember? Raise your hands if you remember when you got married. Do you remember how, like, you just loved each other? Do you remember that? You just remember, like, this is going to be the best decision of my life. Does anybody remember that? You just like looked at them, you're like, I can't even imagine being mad at them. They're just such a lovely creature. Like God plucked them out of heaven, and dropped them. Just love, just love you. Did you think it was gonna be easy then? I guarantee you didn't know how hard it was going to be. Remember when you had your first baby? Do you remember that? Like you're holding that little big baby, like, oh. So easy. Remember when you thought the terrible twos were like the worst ever? And now some of you are old enough to know what the terrible 20s are like. <laughs> you trade those terrible twos for those terrible teens, those terrible 20s. And the, and the church said, Woo! Woo! Storm. Hey, every great story has a great storm. Everything that we are doing in life is going to have adversity. Christianity is going to have adversity, which you find out so much in the middle of the storm. You find out what kind of captain you are in the middle of the storm. My home desk computer has a wallpaper that's from our fuse theme several years ago that was burn the ships, and it says that the, the, the good sailor, no good sailor is made in calm waters, Right? that you gotta have the waves, you gotta have the wind to find out what you are, to find out what's inside of you. Can you handle, can you handle the storm? You'll find out who's with you. 
in the storm? Anybody ever gone through a storm? You found out who was with you? If you can find out who's with you, what else can you find out? <laughs> who's against you? You know that mutinies never happen on calm seas. Did you guys know that? When everything's going great, there's no mutiny. You know when a mutiny occurs? is when there's a storm, when there's an enemy, when someone starts fearing, when someone starts posturing, when someone starts positioning, you'll find out who's with you and you'll find out who's ready to, to look for a way out in the middle of the storm, right? Man, whoo, man, I, it'll surprise you, right? Has anybody ever been surprised? By show of hands, you ever been surprised to find out someone wasn't with you that you would have bet they were with you? Anybody ever found that out? Whoo, that's tough, that is tough. Do you ever think that God's maybe sending you out in the storm to find out who's with him? You ever thought about that? That maybe the storm reveals your loyalty? Are you looking for a way out this morning? And I know that in the crucible of marriage, there are so many exit ramps. So many things that you can get upset about. So many things that you can start to fixate on. So many things to get distracted by. So many things to be tempted by. Isn't this true in our relationship with God as well? Today, the storm was sent to Peter, and Peter was sent to the storm to create some opportunities that will connect back to last week's message in the calling. But I promise you, there's some lessons that we learn in the middle of the storm. It says, around three in the morning, he came toward them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them. He said, have courage. It is I. Now, notice he did not say, it is Jesus. He just said, it's me. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter answered, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Levels upon levels upon levels. That's what we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna dive so hard into this. Man, I'm gonna give y'all a formula that you can follow in the midst of any storm. If you are in the storm this morning, I promise you, you are going to enjoy this message and you're gonna end on worship. Oh, it's gonna be so great. I'm forecasting it. I'll even say I'm prophesying it, that someone is going to get set free today and the church said, amen. Are you ready? Are you ready, church? Oh, I'm so ready. I'm so ready to preach this thing. Mm, mm, mm. I am a fisherman, okay? I'm a bass fisherman. And this boat that they were in, it's not a big boat, okay? And I have been in the middle of the storm. I've been out there in rough water. I've, I've been in the dark when I shouldn't have been. And man, it, it, is, it is always, it's always a little scary once you can't see and you're on the water, all right? I was just fishing and there was these trees, they're all around, and I know they're there, I just can't see them because it was dark. And here they are in the midst of the night, and man, has anybody ever been in the dark and you could swear that you heard something? You could swear that you saw something? Has anybody ever, like, has everybody ever been, let's, let's just step back and like grab a hold of this story. These guys were fishermen, all right? They'd seen it all, but never. Never had they seen Glow Jesus. No one had ever seen Glow Jesus, okay? And Glow Jesus came walking on the water, right? And no one is so spiritual in here. And I, I, I call you out. If you're a Pharisee and you're like, oh, well, of course it was. No, you, you, you would never, ever, if you were out in the middle of the night and saw something glowing in the middle of your storm coming toward, no one would ever be like, let's go towards that. That is you, the opposite. Like, we need to get away from that, right? And all of a sudden, Jesus says, right, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, it's me, right? So immediately we see revelation. Watch this. The revelation is, I'm not a ghost here to haunt you. I'm the God here to help you, right? They thought it was a ghost. But he said, no, it's me. 
It's Jesus. And some of you have a, have, a, have a picture. Really, it's a bad theology where your God is there to haunt you. He's not there to help you. You've painted God as the villain. You paint him in this way like you say, oh, we're going to go to church and they're going to tell me how bad I am. And I know that, that God is just up there and he's trying to take from me or God is trying to punish me. And now he will discipline the disobedient, but he's not trying to punish you. And it's the same mindset that the prodigal had. Some of you need to get out of that prodigal mindset because the prodigal was sitting there eating the slop and he said to himself, I can never be a son again, right? I could only be a servant. And he, and he walked home. He walked all that way home. And in his mind, his dad was just, and I told you so, right? He's just like, oh, you're never going to be good enough. And we make up these stories in our mind that are not rooted in reality. And as he got home, it says that the father came out with open arms and ran to him and embraced him. He hugged him. He kissed him and he said put some shoes on his bare feet put a robe around his shoulders put the ring my ring on his finger because this my son was dead and now he's alive again are you hearing what i'm saying he's not a ghost that is trying to haunt you. He's a God that's trying to help you. And the only thing standing between you and God's help is you. Will you let him help you? Some of you are so prideful. Some of you are so controlling, believing that somehow you're gonna tame this storm you're going to get through this one again. You've done it before. You'll do it. I'm telling you, there's some storms that you can't. You're not going to make it. And God, say, God's, God shows up in the middle of the storm in a miraculous way. He's walking. Do you guys get this? Do you appreciate this? He's walking on water like nobody's ever done that before. Nobody's ever claimed to have done that before. And here he shows up. It's like, hey, guys, you know, what's up? Just, uh, yeah, walking on water. <laughs> it's like, that is amazing stuff. Revelation comes in the middle of the storm. Not after the storm. It was in the middle of the storm. It's like the storm was sent to help you write a story. Because every great story needs a great storm. And Jesus shows up with revelation in the middle of the storm. The word, last week he said, at your word I will let down the nets. One more cast with Jesus in the boat made all the difference. And now he's sitting here and the word is coming to him in the midst of this storm. And he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's amazing how God has this laser focus. Like he's got the scope and it's right on your need, right? And he like the very thing that they're experiencing is fear, and the very thing that he says is, don't be afraid. Are you surprised when you come to church and this word is just for you? Are you surprised that he knows exactly what you need? It says, if somebody whispered in my ear what to say to you, that's God. That's the Holy Spirit working on your heart. Revelation in the most unexpected place. Now we see the next level, recognition. While the wind is ripping and the waves are raging, we must have a relationship close enough to recognize the voice, right? He said, it's me. He didn't say, it's Jesus. He said, it's me. And then Peter's recognition was, oh, is that you, Lord? If that's you, bid me to come. I just wanted to ask you, do you walk close enough that you recognize his voice? Because in the middle of the storm, it's hard to focus on 
glow Jesus out there in the water, right? When you're in the midst of your storm, all you're thinking about is, I need to survive. I need to make it out of this. I need to make it one more week. I, if I move this over here into this column and I move this over here into this column, then we'll have enough to pay them and we'll make it through. And if I just get into counseling and if I, we just go to this person, if, I, if we listen to this study or, or if, we, if we take our kids and we put them in that school and we move friend groups over here and if we could just get through and in the midst of all the chaos Chaos, glow, Jesus is out there like, hey, do you need some help? Yeah, you need, you, you need some help out? You, is, are, is your struggle, is it too much for you at this point? Do you need some help? And some of you, your answer is to row harder when all you have to do is surrender. Do you recognize the voice? Do you hear it calling you in the midst of the storm? Have you walked so close with Jesus that you're like, oh, I know that voice. I know that voice. You see, my fear as a pastor is that you don't read the Bible to get to know him. You don't pray enough to realize what it sounds like when he's answering you. You're not faithful enough in church to build community so that iron can sharpen iron so that you can distinguish the difference between good and evil. You say like it's, it's so clear when you're here, but when you leave, it becomes so difficult sometimes to know what to do. And my fear is that in the midst of your storm, Jesus is showing up and he's bringing you the exact revelation you need. But because you're so chaotic right now in your life, you're not hearing it. It would be sad if today there was a lifeline being thrown out and it was within your reach and you just let it flow by. You see, God is trying to save you, but at some point you have to let him. The response, Peter says, command me to get out of this boat. Man, this, oh, I wish y'all could know what I'm gonna preach on Easter because this is gonna make so much more sense, but this boat is just everything in this story, right? And like it starts, he leaves the boat. Last week we talked about on his best professional day, he just made more money in his life in that day than he had ever made on any day in his life. And he walks away to follow after Jesus. And now that he had Jesus in his boat before, Jesus sent him back out in the same boat. And now he's trying to get out of that boat. And you think that that boat isn't more than just a boat. You understand? Like it's something, like it's the thing that's hold. it's the thing that he was before he met Jesus. And now there's something that God is trying to create on the other side of meeting him. And he says to Jesus, command me. This is his response to the revelation. He recognizes the voice and then he responds and he says, command me, command me to get out of this boat. Last week, when did he let down the nets? At your word, I will. Now he's asking for a word. He's asking for permission. Can I get out of this boat? Man, do you know what no sailor has ever done? Do you know what, no, in the history of all time, do you know what any sailor has ever said? That in the midst of a storm, have you ever, if you've ever been in a storm, you've never thought it'd be better to be out there than in here. Because the boat, the boat is safe. The boat is familiar, right? The boat is what we know. No one ever, ever crosses their mind like, you know what, it'd be better if I just, just jump right out of this boat. <laughs> into the waves, into the storm. No one would, ever, that's not rational thought. Last week, Peter said, Lord, we haven't caught anything. But at your word, I will. Peter realized that impossible is possible if God speaks. If God gives you a word, that impossible becomes possible. Peter said, I want the full immersive experience of following after Jesus. Now, I don't know if any one of you are like me. I found that I'm strange. But does anybody enjoy a good VR 
TikTok slash uh, YouTube. Has anybody ever watched like, it's usually one of the, uh, you know, 40s plus people that puts a VR headset on and then they put them in like a scare room and then they run from the thing that's inside their brain and they run straight into a wall. Has anybody else seen this? Like when TikTok serves me that up, I'm just like, thank you, TikTok. I just, I, I can't get enough. I can't get enough. I just, the psychologist in me is like, you know it's not real, right? You know, but yet it is real to you in this moment. And they're like, ah, and then they run and it's like smash. I mean, they hit it so hard. And I don't know why it brings me great joy. It does. <laughs> It does, it does. I don't, I don't know why, I don't know why. There's just part of me that's like, another, please, another. I think that there are few disciples that want the full immersive experience. I think that they want to be saved. I think the church people, man, they want to be saved. They love that part. Oh, yes, heaven, yes, give me heaven. Give me redemption. They want the saved part. I'm just not sure they want the serving part, right? Because going to church is fun. Going to church is, is amazing. Like worship, like this team up here leading you. I mean, this is the spirit of God. That's fun. But serving, that's hard. You have to rearrange your schedule in order to make time for serving. You have to rearrange your budget to make room for giving. And sometimes people will say like, oh, well, let me pray about it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If the Bible says it, you don't have to pray about it, right? Like you don't have to pray about what the Bible says. If the Bible says that the greatest of all time in heaven will be the one who does what? Serves. You don't have to pray about if you should serve. You should pray about how you will serve. You don't have to pray about if you should give. That's in the Bible. You don't have to pray about that. It's what you should give. I mean, see what I'm saying? Like, it, this is the Bible. And so our response is to have the audacity to say, Lord, command me to get out of this boat. Lord, command me. Give me a word, God. Give me a word. Audacious. Audacious. And then what is the response to the response? Jump. Jump. Every dad in here can relate to this moment, right? Like, you, whenever mom leaves is when dad time begins, okay? And it's, it's different than mom time. And the, and the men say, amen. Like, you start throwing the child. And I don't know why. I don't know who ever taught us this. But it's like, you start kind of like, how high can we get the child, right? It's like, can we get like an inch from the ceiling? Maybe. I don't know. Let's try it out. And kids love it, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then sometimes they get dropped, and you know which ones. And so <laughs> there's something about being a dad that you, you're wanting to teach this kid to trust you. Like you'll put them up on the ledge, and you're like, jump, jump. And you'll have fearful children, and then you'll have children that are too eager, right? And you have to coach both ways. You know, I saw one uh, TikTok uh, of a kid that put on a Superman cape. He's about seven, and he jumped off uh, the top of the stairs, and he hit that landing hard, right? His dad looked over at him, and he's like, what did you, what, did, are you okay? <laughs> this is every dad. Are you okay? All right, don't do that again, all right? <laughs> That's usually the second child, by the way. And you know which one that is in this house, all right? Well, anyway. Jesus is willing to say, jump. Jesus is, now you understand like, even though God is God, I don't think that we don't have room for the impromptu. Like whenever God was talking to Moses on this mountain in the Old Testament, they had a discussion that says that God changed his mind. I don't think that everything is so and that it must be so. I don't think that that's the theology that I would ascribe to. I think that there's room for the impromptu, and I don't think that, that it, was, it was necessary that Peter was going to get out of the boat. I think this was an impromptu moment, and Peter was that guy, right? Peter was that guy. He was like, tell me, like, tell me to get out. You notice that 
None of the other disciples were like, yeah, tell us to get out of the boat, Jesus. You notice that? You notice everybody was like waiting like, oh, let's see what's, uh, <laughs> let's see how this goes, right? Jesus is willing to say jump this morning. Just like when Joshua prayed that the sun would stand still. That's faith. It wasn't for Joshua's glory. It was so that God's story could be written. David taking on Goliath out there in the valley. That wasn't for David's glory. He said that the Israelites may know that there is a God in heaven, that Goliath would know that there's a God in heaven, that the Philistines would know that there's a God in heaven. There's a guy named Benaiah. It says, went down into a pit with a lion on a snowy day. Great book if you haven't read it. And why did he do this thing? It wasn't because it needed to be done. It wasn't because like the lion was a menace. It was, it was like, dude, I'm a man and I want to take on the lion for God's glory, not for my fame so that a story could be written so that more men someday might be motivated and inspired and impassioned to take on the lions of our day. It's not for our glory, it's for his story. Are you writing? Are you writing a story? Can you imagine, can you imagine how many times Peter told this story? It says in verse 29, the second part, and climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. The call to leave the ship. He asked God for permission to leave the ship. The thing that he is later going to struggle with going back to, he's asking permission to leave. Once Jesus got in that boat, it was just a matter of time before Peter was going to have to get out of that boat. See, where he found you is not where he's going to leave you. It's intended to be a progression that you should see some things in your life that he found you in, but you are no longer in, that you want to follow after him more than anything in this world, that you must get to Jesus. Even if it's out there in the middle of the storm, you would say, Jesus, I'd rather come to you and be out there in that than anywhere else. And the church said, amen. Put your hands together if he's calling you to leave the ship. It's about more than walking on the water. It's about more than that. And this is what he's calling you. This is what your purpose is. And I think, how many times did Peter tell that story? Can you imagine? Like, once you get to my age, I'll be 50, May 13th, okay? I know, some of you are like, oh, you look 35. <laughs> no one has said that. <laughs> a couple years ago, I was always looking younger. Now, after this building, whew, <laughs> age you. Once you get old enough, my kids will probably tell you, like, you can number the stories. Oh, that's story number seven. We've heard that story before, right? Like, once you get older, you kind of tell the same stories. I guarantee you this was in Peter's top five. No doubt about it, right? He's like, he meets some people, and they're like, well, how did, how did you get to know Jesus? Dude, let me tell you a story. One night, we were out there, and we were, he's like, yeah, get out, get in the boat, and go over there. I'll meet you on the other side. I did not realize that he meant once we got out there in the middle of a storm that Glow Jesus was going to come walking out there on this water. And then I was like, who is that? And he's like, it's me. And I recognized the voice. I was like, is that you, Jesus? And he's like, yeah, it's me. He goes, can I come out there with you? And he's like, yes. And then I, dude, I came out. I was walking on water. I was, I was I walked on water like no one else in human history can tell that story. You understand, right? Because he met Jesus and he left everything. He got to write a story, a story that has been told for thousands of years. Sermons have been written. People have been inspired. Lives have been changed because he had a story. So that makes the question obvious, right? What's your story? What's your story? I get concerned when Christians don't have a story. When they can't look back and see any difference before they met Jesus, after they met Jesus. 
if you come in contact with the Almighty, shouldn't you have a story? If you've walked with him any distance, shouldn't you have a story? If you stayed married, wouldn't it have been so much easier to not? Shouldn't you have a story? If you raised children that chose Jesus, shouldn't you have a story? If he got you out of it again and again and again, don't you have a story? I just wonder how often you're sharing your story. How can other people experience Jesus if you don't have a story? I promise you that if you'll start walking with him, it won't take long. If you're in this church right now, we're writing a story. And the church said, oh, there, March 15th, there's going to be a story. <laughs> One way or another, there's going to be a story. I believe, do you? Then get out of that boat. Get out of that boat. I don't know what your boat is, but you better get out. Last week, we were trying to buy a boat. This week, we're trying to sell a boat. It says, but when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And I hate that people beat up on Peter about his lack of faith here. That's the way, you want to know a negative person? They'll preach the fail and not focus on the fact he walked on water. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, just like any dad does. I don't know if you've ever taught your children how to swim the hard way. <laughs> As old school, maybe. Oh, you'll learn how to swim today. <laughs> he caught a hold of his hand and he said to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Some of you, I don't have time to preach this, but some of you got out of the boat. Oh, okay, I'm not, no, don't do it. Verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. It's almost like the winds were going to last as long as it took for you to learn the lesson. You want the wind to stop? You want the storm to stop? I hope you're learning. I hope you're learning. Verse 33, it says, Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. You see, here's what I think happened with Peter. I think he got out on the water which is crazy. And I think he was doing something that someone has never done, never will do again. I think the other disciples were probably either in awe or I imagine it's like when they score a touchdown and the teammates are like, yes, go Peter. And he's like, Whoo! you know, I don't know. I don't know. To me, he's like dancing a jig. I don't know. Amazing was happening. And in the midst of the amazing, I think that sometimes we, we, we transfer what's happening in our own mind that we're doing it, right? Because like, he's like, I'm walking on water. And he thought because he's walking on water, it meant that he could walk on water. And then he looked at the wind and he started saying to himself, I can't walk on water. I can't walk on water. And then he started sinking. You see, you can't walk on water. Only Jesus can walk on water. He will allow you to experience walking on water, but don't get it twisted. You can't walk on water. The only reason why you're standing where you're standing is because he has lent you his power. He has lent you his provision. He has given you the love that can take it. He's given you the patience that can make it. And all you have to do is remember it's his power and not yours. Let's give praise to the one that can can walk on the water. Did some of you get it twisted? Did some of you get out there and think like, I'm following Jesus, yeah. And then all of a sudden you start saying, yeah, I want mine. I want, my, I want, I want, my, I want mine first. I want me first. I want to put me on the seat, on the throne. I want to do what I want to do. He took you into a place that you could have never gotten to on your own. And then all of a sudden you started looking at the wind. You lost focus. 
when you began to sing, man, oh, I hope you'll learn the lesson of Peter when you start sinking. You better cry out to Jesus. It says he picked him up, took him to the ship. And then he was saved, right? And then what was the response? It says all those that were in the ship, what'd they do? They worshiped. They worshiped. When he delivers you from drowning, you know what you do? You worship. When he makes you safe from the storm, what do you do? You worship. When the winds obey him, what do you do? You worship. When he saves you, even though you've done it again and again and again, and you say, I'll never do it, and you did it again, and you... And he saves you anyway, and he puts the robe around you, and he puts the shoes that you don't deserve on your feet, and he praises the fact that his son came home, his daughter came home. What do you do? You worship. Worship is the only response to the God of heaven that has saved our soul. It's the only reasonable response. Some of you come to church and you sit here, and you ignore everything that God has done. You don't have a song in your heart. I promise you that storm will keep raging. And the moment that you surrender and say it's God, it's God that saves, it's God that heals, it's God that redeems. As soon as you say it, as soon as you believe it, all of a sudden he reaches down and he picks you up. He puts you in the boat. He speaks to the wind and it stops. And all of a sudden your heart cries out and says, I must worship. I must worship. Why do you feel drawn? Why do you feel drawn into this building? Why do you feel drawn into this environment? There's something inside of you that's saying, worship God. There's something that says, this is what I was made for. Some of you sit there stoically. Listen, I'm going I'm to I'm tell you right now. I'm going to say it's going to happen in two minutes. This is going to happen. This team's going to come out here and we're going to light this place on fire. Some of you are going to sit there drowning. Drowning. Because you refuse to worship. Some of you aren't going to make it. Because that time that God sent that lifeline out there, he said, I'm here. Call on my name. Call on my name. I'll save you. Call on my name, I'll heal you. Call on my name, I'll redeem it. Call on my name, I'll bring it back around. Call upon my name and the love that's left. I can call it. Just like the resurrection from the dead, I can resurrect the relationship again and again. I'll do it. Oh, but when I do it, your only response can be, right? What? Worship. Worship is the power. Worship is the purpose. It's never about more than that. It's worship. Let me pray for you. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that today we might worship you. God, I pray for every person in this room that their response would be worship. Someone sitting in the audience, probably a man, sitting there saying, I don't sing, Tim. I don't sing. When you get to heaven, I promise you, you'll sing. Assuming you're making it to heaven. Hmm. I only want the people to stand to worship. If God has saved you from all your sin, then you stand to worship. If God has delivered you from addiction, then stand in worship. If he redeemed your life from a series of errors and sins, then stand in worship. If you have a story that is for his glory, then stand in worship. But if you don't have a story, and if you don't want to give him glory, then stay in your seat. Stay in your seat. And I hope that let, let everything that you see around you preach to you that he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of the worship. I think you need to find in your heart some walls need to break. Some pride needs to be lowered. You need to humble yourself 
set an example for your family because I believe when the fathers worship, the house will follow. And when the fathers fail to worship, the house will fall. That's what I believe with all of my heart. And the church said, amen. Are you ready, church? Put your hands together. Let's go.